So how did people working 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 years before the birth of Christ create these strange, compelling, extraordinary objects? Well, we know they had the same levels of intelligence and ingenuity as us. Their brains were as fully evolved as ours. What they didn't have was our technology. And it's to find out more about their tools and their craft that I've come to this little town in Germany called Don Assenheim. I'm here to meet a man called Wolf. Thanks for having me. Wolf is one of the few full-time experimental archaeologists in the world. Ah, this is one of the, the famous Venus figures. Yeah. He's commissioned by museums to create exact replicas of Ice Age artworks using only the techniques and technology available at the time. I like the fact that you have to make your own tools. Yeah. This gives us valuable insight into the original process and purpose of these works, of which so little is known. Scraping, scraping, and a lot of patience. Time has told me. I mean, the material from which he's made mm -hmm. is... Mammoth tusk. OK, well, this is a block of wood, but... No, this is mammoth tusk. Is it? This is an original mammoth tusk from okay. Siberia. No, I'm not. Maybe it is about 40,000 till 60,000 years old. <laughs> wow, I'm so impressed. Yeah. But I imagine a mammoth tusk isn't the easiest thing in the world to get hold of, especially if you tell them up front, I'm going to destroy it <laughs> in order to make Stone Age object. Can well, you see it I works? Can, I can see it's not going to be a quick process. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> so how many hours of work would you think uh, someone in the Stone Age actually would take for a figurine such as this? I guess about 75, 80 hours. I see what you mean. I, I think your, yeah, your, your primary tool is actually patience. Uh, the most intriguing and the most uh, time expensive uh, piece was the Lion Man, the famous Lion Man. And this is the biggest one. This is the chief of the whole gang, as we say. The chief, he looks like a chief, doesn't he? <laughs> the lion man. The lion man, the famous lion man. There's something almost ancient Egyptian about it. Yes, um, but it's far, far from Egypt. It's about uh, 35,000 years back in time. I made it from an elephant's tusk, from a modern, um, uh, from a modern tusk with uh, flint tools. And it took me... I stopped counting on 365 hours. And after working for... Those 370 plus hours. What did you conclude? Maybe somebody told an artist, make me a lion man. And this man was set free for about four months or five months or six months. Uh, he hadn't to hunt, he hadn't to gather anything. He only had to do this object. Your opinion is this is a Stone Age commission? Maybe. <laughs> So this is another find from uh, the Holofels cave. It's supposed to be the oldest instrument of the world. It's a flute made out of um, vulture wing bone. Vulture wing bone yes. flute? Yes. This is your reconstruction? This is my reconstruction. So how old is this? About 38, 40,000 years old. 38,000 years yes. old? Do you just blow through? It's No, it, it's very Go sophisticated. On, you show me how. <laughs> <laughs> I can get only one or two turns out of it. Let's hold like this, and you do it like that. So this is what Orpheus would have played. Yes. <laughs> the god of music. curious about about this object so what does it do uh, you put a spear inside here and you throw it 
Not an arrow, a spear. Yeah. Wow. It's about two meters long, the spear. The first thing that really strikes me is how unnecessarily ornate it is. I mean, it's some kind of animal. What's the animal? It's pretty an, an ibex, a young ibex. So this is the sort of animal they might have hunted? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So the animal that they're, that they're hunting sort of presides over its own death. <laughs> Does it actually work? Yes, it works. Should we have a try? I'd love to have a try. OK, come on. <laughs> Are you sure? Go on then, show me, show me how it works. Well, you put uh, the hook in the hollow at the rear right. and grab it like a hammer and you open up a thumb and forefinger here and throw the spear then with a propulsor. Oh, I see, OK. That's how it works. OK. <laughs> Just technique. Yeah. OK. OK. Well, it flew. Well, it flew. <laughs> it stuck. If a it's rabbit, if a rabbit had been <laughs> sleeping on that spot, it might have had a nasty surprise. But it's interesting, because you realise that, in fact, it's, it's a lever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. good. Really good. What do you think of um, early man? Do, do you have a lot of respect for him? Yes, I have a lot of respect. Uh, 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 respect because I admire their patience hmm. and their deep insight and feeling for nature and their environment. That's what you can see on the art object as well as on the on the everyday gear they made. It's all made with feeling, with love. Everything's finely made, ornamented, and yeah, I admire their patience. I think the more you learn about the prehistoric world, prehistoric society, the more you realise that the popular image of the caveman as a chest-thumping, lusty savage really is a fiction. And it's one that's been perpetuated, fixed in caricature form. I'm thinking of films like Possibly the worst film ever made, in fact, a caveman starring Ringo Starr, <laughs> in which, uh, naturally enough, caveman invents the drums. <laughs> Even more amusingly absurd, perhaps, is One Million Years BC, starring the fabulously pneumatic Raquel Welch, in which we discover that cave people, as well as inventing painting, uh, invented backcombed hairstyles of astonishing complexity. The irony is that of all of the popular versions of caveman society to have been created, perhaps the Flintstones is the one that brings us closest to the truth, because the great joke behind the Flintstones is, of course, that Fred and Wilma are just like us. And the irony is that it seems that prehistoric man was much more like us than we often like to think. But ultimately, if you really want to get to grips with both the compelling strangeness and the surprising familiarity of prehistoric man and woman, you have to go and look and think about the art that they left behind. And for that reason, I'm back in northern Spain. Geologically, much of this region is limestone and provided Ice Age people with the deep, sheltered caves they needed for refuge. I've been lucky enough to get access to another fascinating subterranean site. This cave is called Tito Bastillo. It was only discovered in 1968, and it's one of the most intriguing, surprising places I've ever visited. After all, don't it feel like nothing? Like walking away. Like a mouthful of rain. Wow, it 
It's so spooky in here. One of these great gothic spires formed by stalactites and stalagmites. Ah, this is what I've been looking for. See these marks here? That's red ochre. And that's been carbon dated. It's about 13,000 years old. And what does it mean? There's this theory that I really like, which is that this is a kind of gallery guide to what's coming up, because if you follow the lines, you see that there's this accumulation of red dots that seem perhaps to indicate the sites further along in the cave complex. In fact, this is a map that tells an Ice Age person who's never been here before where they're going to find the objects of their religion, their ritual, anyway, where they're going to find the images. So let's press on. You can really understand why people might, once they've conquered their fear of the dark, you can understand why they might be drawn to a space like this. It feels like a cathedral. I love this central element where a stalactite meets stalagmite. It's almost like a nature-created version of Michelangelo's famous picture of the hand of God meeting the hand of Adam. This took a million years, maybe more, to form. So that's what a million years looks like. This is it. I've read about this, but I've never seen it. It's one of the one of the really rarest things. The structure of the limestone has been hollowed out so that it resembles almost like the inside of a human body. To me, it suggests the pelvic bone, the girdle. It's like a kind of tower of bones that feels like being inside a human body, and that's absolutely to the point here, because what this chamber contains is a series of astonishing schematic representations of the female genitals. It may have been some kind of chapel dedicated to female fertility, and look, this is, this is where you really see the images. Are these Schematic representations of the female sex have been carbon dated 30,000, 33,000 years old, so that's what they think these are. But this one I'm not sure about, you see, because I wonder if this isn't actually a depiction of a woman's body. So there's her behind, containing a womb, and, and I wonder if that strange little homunculus within that circle isn't meant to indicate an embryo, a baby. So, in a sense, this is, this is the oldest known human cave of motherhood. Because these people were all of our mothers. The need to be able to represent the world around us and our place in it is, is what these objects evidence. The, the priorities of a society are not uh, limited to the, the food and the physical comfort. Alongside that, and clearly given almost equal weight, is this exploration of our place in the world.